When Paul says his famous statement, to live is Christ and to die is gain, how do we usually take that? I know for me, well, just a reminder, Paul is writing the Philippians from prison. He's facing the possibility, we expect, of execution on the table anyway. Um, I would bet that when we look at that phrase, to live is Christ and to die is gain, we typically focus on the latter part of that, to die is gain. At least I have growing up hearing it. Um, as if Paul primarily wanted to tell the Philippians, hey, it's, it's okay if you die, it's okay if I die, it's actually really good, being with Christ is better. And we sometimes think, man, I need to learn from Paul how to be convinced like he is that to depart and be with Christ is far better, better than anything that the world has to afford us. So, like, I think to myself, man, Paul is most mature because he thinks to die is gain. Um, because in our reality, though at times it sounds really good to be with Jesus, we do a lot of things to actually avoid death, right? Because it's scary, or there's maybe things in this life that we want to do before we die. And, but we can tell ourselves, and we know when that's the case, we're just not understanding or fully grasping the glory, the presence of Christ, and how good it would be to be with him. But I would say that if you consider the context of of that phrase to live as Christ and to die as gain in Philippians, and, and even the context of the whole book or letter, um, I don't think Paul is first and foremost trying to convince the Philippians that to die is gain, but that he must live for something greater than just him personally getting what's best for him. Um, it's in this section of the letter, like if you read a few verses after that in chapter 1, Paul actually determines that although for his sake, for his own sake, it would be better, far better for him to depart and be with Christ, he says it's actually more necessary for me to live. Why? For the sake of the Philippians. For their sake. He says, for me, in verse 21 of chapter 1, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Notice he doesn't give any explanation of that. It's like, of course it would be far better for me to die and be with Christ. But, he says, to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus. Now, I think this is like a, a very profound truth that gives some purpose to our the reason for our very existence. It kind of gives some explanation why, upon belief, God doesn't just take us home to be with him in heaven in his presence. And part of that is because continuing on in this life isn't about what's best for you. It's about what's best for others. Again, I'll say that continuing on in this life isn't about what's best for you as an individual, but it's about what's best for others or your contribution to others. You guys understanding that? So Paul decides that for the sake of others, he believes actually God is going to free him from prison and maybe death. Of course, he would rather be with Jesus, but God determined that it was more necessary for Paul to stick around and for the progress and joy and the faith of others, of the Philippians. He's not trying to convince the Philippians. I promise it would be better to depart and be with Christ. That's like, duh. Of course that's what I would prefer. So I think it's the same for you and for me. That as long as you haven't died yet, God has determined it more necessary to keep you around for the progress and joy in the faith of others. We could probably just stop there and kind of evaluate our, our lives. Are you living for your sake or are you living for the sake of others? Because if you want to live your best life, I'll tell you how to get it. Go do something crazy and get martyred. Or at least make sure in your medical records you have do not resuscitate, right? So that you can depart and be with Christ. 
Because for you, if you're a follower of Christ, in a way it would be far better to depart and be with Christ. Now obviously I'm not promoting suicide. Paul isn't promoting suicide himself. He's actually saying, hey, this, this, this could potentially happen to me because I've been pursuing preaching the gospel. So are you living for your sake or for the sake of others? Are you living for the sake of others that they too might have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus? That's why God has you here. That's one of the reasons he has us here. We talk a lot about the Great Commission. Jesus says make disciples. Jesus' followers, when he was leaving earth, they knew that, okay, now is the time to go make disciples. Maybe there's a time while Jesus was there to rejoice and to celebrate and to spill perfume and, and oil on his body and, and just celebrate that he's there with us, but he's going to go and leave now for at least a couple thousand years. And the disciples know, hey, there's, there's a, a job to do, and they begin to go do it until they died and then received what was best for themselves, the presence of Jesus again. So as long as you haven't died yet, God has determined it more necessary to keep you around for the progress and joy in the faith of others. <coughs> but... Um, so th that's just kind of leading into where we're going tonight. Philippians 2, 1 through 5, we'll basically look at. It's one of my favorite uh, little sections in Scripture, if not my favorite. And um, maybe you know that about me, especially verse 3. In humility, count others more significant than yourself. Count others more significant than yourself. I like it. Uh, because I think it succinctly kind of strikes at the core of what Christianity or what following Christ actually looks like. It's the characteristic of a person that kind of lends credence, I think, to the truth of the gospel, the transforming power of the gospel, maybe more than anything else, because I think it's impossible to live that way truly apart from Christ. And I think... Um, you can probably pinpoint the, the heart of fallen humanity with one pervasive kind of general characteristic selfishness that's what fallen humanity does and is or as my pastor back in Bakersfield would say self-centeredness self-centeredness me first that's the state of fallen humanity if you think about roll through a list of sins in your ideas a lot of that is you thinking about yourself as the most important. I think you can also pinpoint the heart of redeemed humanity with this characteristic that we're going to look at tonight of selflessness. Selflessness. And I just think if we, like, if the ten of us here as followers of Jesus could just demonstrate well this one quality, your interest before my own, we would shine bright like the sun in this world, like Paul goes on to say later in chapter 2. Um, so at this point in Philippians, and when we get to chapter 2, Paul has just started to kind of transition into the instructional part of the letter. So he started out saying, here's, uh, you know, thank you for your money that you sent me, and um, here's what's going on with me. I'm in prison, but everything's going to be okay. I'm sure, certain that I'm going to be delivered. And that his instruction to the Philippians actually starts in chapter 1, verse 27, and he opens there with this theme kind of about unity, okay? And that rolls over into what we're looking at today. Paul is commanding the Philippians in this section um, to live in unity because unity speaks. It says something. And, and he wants the Philippians to, as he puts it, stand firm in one spirit, one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And he, he wants that unity among them. And he goes on to say that it, with that unity, then they won't be frightened in anything by their opponents. And it's a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your Philippian salvation and that from God. So he says unity in this section. Unity makes us strong. He knows that the Philippians that we, we think are beginning to face quite a bit of persecution in their church. And he knows that, Paul knows that Satan can take down an individual, but he can't take down the church. And so unity is what they need for strength together, side by side for the faith of the gospel. And unity says also, unity speaks, and it's saying we have been saved by God. What, what can be done to us? 
how do we attain unity is where he kind of leads to next. And I would say it's, it's with this word selflessness. So Philippians 2, 1 through 5 says this. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So it starts out kind of strange. I've always thought it kind of strange if there is any of these things, any encouragement in Christ, any comfort and love. And uh, he's kind of using, I think, like a, a kind of rhetorical way of speaking. Like some commentators say, you could even just say, since you have experienced some of these things, encouragement in Christ, comfort from love, participation in the Spirit. He's saying, hey, is there any encouragement that we have in Christ? Yeah. Is there any comfort that we have in the love of Christ? Yeah. Are we able to have fellowship with him? Have we experienced affection and sympathy? Of course we have these things. And so if you have received any of that, then here's what to do. Here's what I want you to start into. Or if you actually know these things, if you've experienced them, then start doing these things or start being these things. If there's any, if there is any substance to your faith, if these things are real, then here's how it ought to come out in you. Be of the same mind, have the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Uh, we're not going to look deeply at verse 2, um, but the idea here is unity, obviously. Seeing ourselves as one. Placing myself in line behind the whole of us. Paul says, my joy will be complete when y'all are unified. Okay, so what ruins unity? selfishness or self-centeredness when someone starts to think too highly of themselves if you think about it and they start to move themselves to the front of the line that starts to break apart unity so in verse 3 of chapter 2 he says do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit but in humility count others more significant than yourselves selfish ambition uh, could just mean some translation just say selfishness trying hard to achieve things just for your own sake, for yourself. The NET notes add, don't even think any thoughts motivated by selfish ambition. Like it's a, a deep meaning that goes even to our thought life. Um, several years ago, probably 10 years ago, I started writing a blog. And um, I realized after a while and after always checking the comments and how many views or whatever, I realized that I was actually writing the blog for myself. I wasn't writing it for other people. It wasn't that I actually wanted people to know this information. It was I just wanted to write it about myself and make me feel good and maybe some publisher would recognize it and give me a book deal and then I could become more famous. And so the content had nothing to do with me. It was just my own selfish ambition to kind of get me somewhere. And uh, in light of that, I, in light of this verse really, I had to shut it down. It was. It was no good for anybody except myself. Uh, vain conceit could just be translated to just vanity. Okay, um, It's the person who's always talking about what they have done. They just have to let people know, here's what I've done, here's who I know, here's what I've worked with, here's what I've accomplished, here's my resume, my credentials. Or maybe the person that always has to be right, always has to know something about everything and always has to know a little bit more than the next person about everything. Uh, vain conceit also kind of has this idea of emptiness, like you're making something of yourself that you're not even. Like you have no basis even for your bragging. It's just empty. Um, did you know that Mary Beth and I have opened in concert for Toby Mac and Mercy Me and Matthew West. Can you believe that? Isn't that cool? Kind of. 
<laughs> yeah, it, it's cool unless you're a musician and you know that, like most openers, that, that doesn't necessarily mean something impressive. Like sometimes it does. I think with Maddie, it's impressive. Like they actually, she's actually good and gets to tour with this good band. But for us, I think it was like, well, we spent all the budget on the good artists, and we just have this tiny bit left. Who can we get to come in for this little amount here? And so, but, but the, I can use that to brag and say, well, look at this, and look who I've worked with, and look who we, and it's like, that's, that's vain conceit, that's empty. It doesn't even hold what I'm saying, even though it's, there's a little bit of truth to it. It doesn't even make sense. It doesn't hold up. I was just the leftover. So selfish ambition and vain conceit. Um, Really, we say these things and we do these things to kind of position ourselves within the people around us, right? Like we want to rank higher and higher, and so we pursue selfish ambition and we try to make ourselves and others believe that we're better than we actually even are, or at least better than they are. And we're constantly like just presenting our personal resumes to each other. How can I make sure that somehow in the conversation, it's not obvious, but I slip in this information about myself. <laughs> and we're constantly uh, sizing each other up. Um, I remember a, a while back learning that um, there's a friend of mine told me that whenever he would walk into a room and meet somebody new, he would kind of size himself up with that person, like literally kind of compare his physique with that person that he was talking to. And he's constantly aware as he met new people how he kind of compared in muscle size. And so it's like a dominance kind of thing. Like, okay, now I know, okay, they're, they're a little bigger than me and I could probably take him. Okay. And like, to me, that, that was, um, like I remember thinking how silly that is because I, I, I won't say I never think about that, but I rarely think about that when I'm meeting somebody new. That's just not on my mind. But then I realized that I think most of us, in some ways, we do that. It might not be physique, um, but uh, and with maybe a lot of guys do that, I don't know. Maybe with girls, it's some other ways that you're measuring up with each other and just kind of trying to decide, well, where do I, where do I place in this kind of setting? Um, maybe for intellectuals, it's a, a different kind of way that you're kind of deciding, well, where do I fit on the spectrum with this person? Maybe for spiritual people, it's okay. Where do I? How do I kind of line up? What what ranking am I in? And how can I how can I make sure that at least people know that I'm at least here, or at least maybe a little bit higher than maybe I actually am, like we do on our job resumes, right? We're a little better than we actually are. Do that. Um, but all of that, you think, well, how does that affect unity? It it messes it up. Like when we're fighting against unity with self centeredness, we lose the power of of us and, and what the us together speaks. So do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but, or instead, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Um, humility, at the time of Paul writing this, wasn't considered a virtue, like in some circles we consider it today. Like we, as, as Christians, we kind of understand humility in a positive light, like it's good to be humble. Uh, but in Rome, and even in other societies throughout history, um, humility just means a weakness of character or unfitness and it, it was dishonorable to be considered humble. That's something that a, a slave is. They're just, oh, look at that humble, lowly person. Um, one ancient writer, Horace, said that the Romans were absurd slaves to fame who are stupefied by titles and masks. Because what was seen as a virtue in the world was, was dignity, was this quality of being worthy of honor and respect, and that people would know that, where you come from, where your family's background is, your achievements, your pedigree, your intelligence, your wealth, the car you drive, or chariot you drive, or whatever, right? <laughs> Compared to everybody else, do you have dignity? So people sought dignity and honor for themselves, not slave-like humility, okay? But the Bible, literally, our Bible changed the value, from what I understand, of, of humility into something good. Um, the, the first, uh, the 
Qumran community kind of lived this out of, out of the Old Testament, and the Christian community lived it out of the New Testament, because Jesus says, we can read in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, God's son, for I am gentle and lowly or humble in heart. Jesus, God's, God's son, the second person of the Trinity is, is humble. So we should be too, or certainly that's a virtue that we might strive to have. So the Bible kind of, and Christianity and Jesus kind of redeems this, this quality of humility, uh, though there's been plenty of times, and even some people now can just look down on humility as something that's uh, less than. C.S. Lewis says, um, do not imagine that if you meet a really humble man, he will be what most people call humble nowadays. He will not be a sort of greasy, smarmy person who is always telling you that, of course, he is nobody. Probably, all you will think about him is that he seemed a cheerful, intelligent chap who took a real interest in what you said to him. I love that. Like, if, you're, if you meet a humble person, it's probably just going to be somebody who is cheerful and listened to you. And he says, if you do dislike him, it will be because you feel a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. So see, humility isn't self-disparagement. I'm so stupid, I'm so lowly, I'm no good, I'm insignificant. It's not like an inferiority complex, like, oh man, dang, I don't stack up against these people around me. The um, uh, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament calls biblical humility a willingness to accept a lower position. Okay? A willingness to accept a lower position. It's the opposite of, of what we tend to try to do of taking position above the other people around us. It's a willingness to take a lower seat at the table. It's a willingness to come underneath somebody at your own expense to do something that they need. It's a willingness to be like Christ who lowered himself to wash the disciples' feet. Humility I, I think that's a biblical good definition, a willingness to accept a lower position. And humility frees us to live in a certain way. In humility, Paul says, then count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. All right, I want to point something out about count others more significant than yourselves. And it's the word others. Count others more significant than yourself. You know what that word means? You kind of know, you know what the English word means. Um, others, alelon, Greek, means one another. Okay? That's most of the other times you'll see it in scripture, one another. Okay? Um, so notice the plurality of what Paul is telling the church. You all count yourselves, or, or I'm sorry, count one another as more significant than yourselves. Okay? Why is one another important? It's, it's reciprocal. This is something that this person does for this person, and this person does for this person. This person considers this person more significant, this person considers this person more significant. It's a one another reality. Why does that matter? Because if you count me more significant than you, and I count you more significant than me, then who's actually more significant? We don't know. It doesn't even matter who's more significant. We no longer have to place ourselves and make judge, a judgment call on everybody else. We no longer have to size each other up in the many ways that we do. Count one another more significant than yourselves means that one of us are actually more or less significant maybe, but, but we can all be treated as more significant. Like sign me up for that kind of community when everybody's treating me as more significant and everybody, I'm treating you as more significant. So it doesn't matter, like if it's a one another reality, it's not just me treating all of you like you're more significant than me, but it's you treat that person also that way and you treat that person that way, 
it doesn't matter who is actually of, say, a higher position. What matters is that together, we are counting one another, the whole, as more significant than ourselves as individuals, which is the most direct route to unity, to consider others more significant than ourselves. So practically what that might mean is don't find the people in your community who you think are actually a little more significant than you and look only after their interests above your own. Okay? That's still just kind of ranking people. Okay? So I know a lot of pastors that get in big churches that get really nice um, things and toys because they seem to be a more significant part of the body, right? Um, you're doing the work of God, pastor, so you deserve more. And I know pastors that beyond their salary, okay, salary is one thing, this is what they are working for, but beyond that are just given cars and houses and vacations, not because they have a need for it, but because they're the pastor and they're more significant. And so people kind of look for that person in the congregation. Okay, well, uh, maybe he's, he's even worked a little bit more than me, so it, it, I could give up some of what I have for that person. But the, if we see the kind of one another idea in this, the equality, this kind of levels the playing field so we don't fall into that trap, okay? So don't take me, your pastor, out to a fancy dinner if there's people in the church who are struggling to put food on the table. Um, you could say, you could say um, that you're looking out for their interest above your own, somebody that has a little bit, maybe more than you, and you're saying, well, it's still, at least I'm still giving up what I have for the sake of that other person. But if you're only doing it because you put everybody on the scales and you're saying, well, this person deserves a little bit more, then are you really doing what Paul is commanding here? Um, Basically, you haven't lived out this verse just because you're giving your nice things to people who you think deserve it more than other people deserve it, or more than you deserve it. Um, some commentators think that verses 3 and 4 are actually about considering not the deservingness of the people in your community, but the needs of the people. Count one another's needs as more significant than your own needs. Let each of you look not only to his own interests or needs, but look to the needs of the people. Who has the greatest need? Oftentimes it's the person who seems least significant, right? Not most significant. And what is my proper response when I see this person of little significance or great significance in need, but to humbly place myself below them and consider that insignificant person more significant than myself? If you remember, um, when we talked about uh, generosity and stewardship months ago, um, it's kind of like what we said about the church community, the early church community would share all things in common, right? Um, and we were saying God gives some people in the community more resources and some less so that those with more will give and share with those who have less, so that the end result of that is that God would be thanked and that God would be seen as the one who provides exactly what we need together as his people. So we're not to think, well, 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 who deserves this and who actually should have more than another people and who's worked harder, all that, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we recognize and that we thank God that he is a generous giver and he's caring for us, through us. And what matters in counting one another as more significant than ourselves is not that we are positioning ourselves in the proper order, but that we are displaying the unity of the spirit, what God is doing among us, which is a clear sign to the enemy of their destruction and of our salvation that we have from God. You guys, are you, do you understand why that kind of one another concept matters? Like it's not just me as an individual doing that to others. Uh, considering them more significant, but that's happening all around. So it kind of takes, it, 
the yeah. selfishness out of it. They take the selfishness out and say, we don't really know, we're not even making a judgment value because we're just all doing the same thing for each other. And y'all, I just think if we as a as a church community continue to like grow in, and I'm not just like the, the financial thing is one, but I'm just talking about time and, and other resources that we have in truth and discipleship. If we continue to grow in Philippians 2, 3, and 4, then you don't have to worry about yourself because I'm counting you more significant. And I don't have to worry because you're counting me more significant. And everyone kind of turns out equal and everyone is significant and everyone is served. You guys see how like beautiful the design of the church is supposed to be. And now there's this amazing picture that that people should see and they say, wow, there's great benefit to being in the family of God. And I just, oh, I love to see us live into this and to continue to grow in this. And I imagine the perfect version of this. And, and some of these types of things I've already seen, but somebody in our church says, hey, I need a car next week. And somebody else says, oh, you can you know, use my car. I have two. Well, somebody on the outside could look in on that and say, well, wait a second, what if you need your other car? Like, you have a second car for a reason. It's like, well, gosh, I didn't, even, I didn't even think about that, but they have a need next week, so I'm just going to let them use my car. Or somebody here in our church says, hey, I noticed that you didn't get much sleep last week because of baby, and why don't I come for over for a couple hours and let you take a nap while I watch the baby? And somebody might look at you and say, well, you're exhausted too. And you say, man, I don't even, I wasn't even thinking about myself. I just know they're exhausted and I want to serve them. Or maybe somebody here is like, hey, I can't pay my medical bills. I'm doing the best I can, but I just, I'm just so behind. And somebody else says, okay, well, what is it? $100, $500, $1,000? Somebody else on the outside might look in at that and say, well, well gosh, what, you know, that's your emergency fund or that's your retirement fund or that's your kid's college fund. Like, what if you have an emergency? And, that person's like, well, they have an emergency. They can't pay their bills, so I'm not thinking about myself. This family of God thing is a, is a one another thing, so I'm worried less about myself. Even Paul, he says to the Philippian church later in this letter, after he, they had sent him some sort of gift while he was in prison to help to meet his need, and he tells them in Philippians, I'm so happy that you gave that gift to me, but not so much because I needed it. Like, I can get by with, with anything, little to nothing, but I'm happy because you will be blessed by it. And then he goes on to say, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And some of that need that the Philippians are going to have provided for, um, for them will probably come from other believers, or somebody, who, somebody else who's considering themselves less significant than the Philippian church is going to give them help in their time of need. I just think it's, it's beautiful what God has designed um, in order to bring us together in unity and show a picture of Christ that is only possible in Christ. That doesn't happen quite like that outside of him. So let's demonstrate the gospel in our unity and in this one thing, at least, selflessness will be very different if we do. Um, I want to end by uh, bursting the bubble, okay? Um, the truth is, when we hear the concept, count others more significant than yourself, yourselves, we struggle with that. And why do we struggle with it, except that it... It sounds good in theory, right? But still, my own personal application of that is that I, as an individual, ought to treat others in the community as more significant than myself. And what if they don't do the same for me? What if it's not reciprocated? What if I give more than I get, right? Because then it's not fair. That leaves everyone else as more significant than me, or that's not fair because that leaves me as insignificant, and that's not fair because that's not true. They're not more significant than me. 
At least we should be able to say we're equally as significant. And maybe at times, if I'm honest, I think that that person, I, I think that I am actually a little more significant than them at times. And if I can't count on other people to repay me, then I'm out. It's too, it looks good on paper, but what if it doesn't work out? But remember our definition of humility. A willingness to accept a lower position. God isn't calling us to pretend that others are more significant so that they will pretend that you're more significant. God is calling you to real humility where you choose to count them as more significant and are willing to accept a lower position, even if you are risking being left insignificant, even if you actually were more significant than those others, which you're not, but there's one who is, the, the one with infinitely greater significance who gave everything to the insignificant. What Paul uh, is asking us to do is a, impossible apart from Christ. This one characteristic, this selflessness humbly counting others more significant than yourselves, it shines so bright because it can only be accomplished in Christ. Verse 5 says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to describe the example of the one whom we are to reflect. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or grasped at, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. God calls us to be obedient in humility like his son is, to have the same mind as Christ Jesus. Did Jesus count us more significant than himself because we actually are more significant than him? I don't think so. He, Christ is positioned categorically, infinitely higher than us. So when he gave his life away for us and to us, He wasn't weighing whether or not we deserve it instead of him. Jesus didn't count us as more significant because he looked around who who, who deserves to be given more significance. Jesus counted us more significant because of how great our need is, right? And he determined to not only look to his own interest, but to look to ours. And Jesus... didn't count us more significant than himself because he was sure he would be repaid. Because the truth is, we can't really one another with Jesus, right? Try as we may our entire lives to repay this one who is supremely, infinitely more significant, we won't be able to. But God the Father is and does. So verse 9 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So considering Christ's example of humility, I want to go back and read those first five verses of chapter 2 again. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count one another more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours 
in Christ Jesus? Will we still cry out, that's not fair. They're not more significant than me. I might not be repaid. Okay, are you willing to accept a lower position? And do you think that if Jesus, the Son of God, did, and there's any encouragement from Christ and any comfort from his love, any participation in the Spirit, that we can do the same? I think that selflessness is what God is calling us to, to do, who he's calling us to be as a community. And if we don't do it together, we won't experience true unity. And our, our witness will be weak and will be left to the strength of ourselves as individuals. But even if you do this counting others more significant than yourself, even if you do this alone by yourself and it doesn't work out for you as well as it ought to work out in the ideal church scenario, you really have nothing to lose. Because even if your significance isn't returned to you through the church, he will exalt the humble, we read all over scripture, like he did Jesus. Think of Matthew 18 that says that at this particular time, Jesus' disciples came saying, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who has the most significance? And calling to him a child, he put a child in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The humble will be exalted. So, y'all, no church, let's in humility count one another more significant than ourselves. All right? I grow in that. Let me pray for us. Father, the example of Christ is mind-blowing, um, uh, but that is who we are in. We are in you. And so I believe this is a work that your spirit and the, the participation that we have with you and with your spirit um, and with your people, the, the fellowship that we have, I believe that it's, it's possible to live into these realities that is impossible apart from you. So for the sake of our witness to those around us and for the sake of our own strength and for the sake of the glory of Jesus, we ask your help in moving continually towards an attitude not of me first, but of others first. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.